please welcome the author of Arthur Phillip, Sailor, Mercenary, Governor Spy, John Le Carre. No, sorry, Michael Pembroke. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David, and um, thank you, Andrew, for your enlightening speech. <laughs> uh, thank you. Now, thank you also to James Phillips and to Greg Lindsay and Cassandra Wilkinson. It's a delight to be here. It's also a delight to see so many friends and acquaintances, uh, including at least one uh, who was a witness in the case before me several years ago. Uh, uh, <laughs> World. Now, um, what I would like to do is, is take some snapshots from the book. I, I would like you to understand that my book is not about Australia. Uh, four chapters out of 14 uh, are addressed to that topic. One, one chapter is set in New South Wales, one chapter on the voyage, and two chapters are set in England and concern the preparation, planning and thinking behind the, the establishment of the colony. But the other ten chapters are about the life of a British naval officer and I wouldn't want anyone to think that the whole book is concerned with or concentrated on uh, the foundation of this country. But it may be that some of the inspiration for the title to this talk did come from one of the epigrams which <coughs> appear at the beginning of the book uh, which is a quote from uh, a very highly regarded book by Alan Atkinson um, in which Alan said, Botany Bay, it has been argued, was meant as a gulag before gulag. Nothing could be further from the truth. What Alan Atkinson was doing was directly refuting the, the, uh, the central thesis of Robert Hughes book, The Fatal Shore. Uh, Robert Hughes is a wonderful writer and an engaging uh, writer, uh, and, uh, but, he, but he was carried away by his enthusiasm when he wrote that book, and it, uh, he, he gave a broad picture, but in doing so, he did not focus on the original decisions and the thinking behind the establishment of the colony in the first place. Now, I've said, and I think it's probably entirely correct, that what happened after Philip is a different story and there's room for criticism there in abundance because after Philip left when land grants had been made to convicts and marines and seamen settlers started to arrive uh, the New South Wales Corps which became the Rum Corps also arrived things changed um, commerce greed and land ownership took over and transformed the nature of the colony but that was not the way Sydney, Nepean and Philip envisaged it when they started. Now, I'll come back to that. It's, it's worthwhile giving you a little bit of context as to how this, this absurdly ambitious experiment started. Um, everyone knew, everyone here knows, that after the end of the American Revolutionary Wars in 1783, Virginia and Maryland, which were the colonies to which British convicts were sent, became closed off. Uh, the way convicts were treated in those uh, pre-war days was, was um, far from satisfactory. The British government had no interest other than consigning the convicts to merchants who signed uh, receipts for them, who then took ownership of the convicts, took them to, to, the, uh, to the east coast of the United States, or the 13 colonies as they were then, and sold them. They sold them effectively in bondage to farmers and other people who would use them and they were never heard of again. Um, there was no government control. They became controlled and owned by um, white property owners, principally in Virginia and Maryland. What, um, what happened in the colony of New South Wales was that it was intended that the convicts would form um, the basis of a new settlement and the twin pillars of that settlement were the cultivation of the land which had to be undertaken and the issuing of land grants to provide an incentive to convicts. So that um, you, you had um, uh, uh, statements being made such as um, if uh, 
uh, one sure way to convert a thief into an honest person was to give him a grant of land. This was the thinking which lay behind the times. Thomas Jefferson in, in America at the time uh, hailed as heroes the cultivators of the land. So it, it principally Sidney, Nepean and Philip were thinking that they would build a society by using convicts as the, uh, s uh, as the basis for it and giving them the incentive of having the land, owning something which they would never <coughs> otherwise have the opportunity to own uh, and then uh, cultivating it, um, de uh, having children and families and uh, developing society. Now, it's, it's well known that there was a problem with the convicts at the time because uh, as in present times, uh, there was a popular clamour uh, for offshore detention. And uh, the, the Lord Mayor of London and many other politicians um, uh, latched on to the public displeasure about the presence of convicts on the Thames and in the hulks and overflowing in the prisons. And uh, that was a pressing issue. But it wasn't the only issue. There were at least three other factors that influenced the thinking behind the establishment of the settlement. Pitt, um, just like his father before him, aspired to have a global commercial network, a, a trading network, and the British were very poorly served south of the equator. Uh, south of the equator in the Atlantic, they only had St. Helena, uh, and um, they didn't have uh, anything in southern Africa at this time. The Dutch owned the Cape of, Good, Cape of Good Hope. They had India, of course, but that was north of the equator. Uh, and they had nothing in the southern Indian Ocean. They had nothing in the, in the South Pacific. And they were concerned about French intrusions in uh, those parts of the world, and especially in India. They also were very concerned about the need to have naval materials to keep the, uh, the uh, India squadron, uh, the naval squadron based in the Bay of Bengal, um, in, um, in, in timber for masts and, um, and timber planking and also co rope rigging and cordage. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to realise if you, if you look into it that the standard workhorse of the Royal Navy then was the 74-gun ship. It required, in terms of uh, rigging, rope and cordage, about 40 miles of hemp and f approximately five acres of sail. The sail came from flax, the, ro the rigging, rope and cordage from hemp, and of course the timber uh, came from oak. A approximately 75 acres of oak trees, and these had to be mature oak trees, were required for every 70 gun ship. So the demand on supplies was huge. And when the India squadron was in trouble during the American Revolutionary Wars, it was soon realised that it was not satisfactory to rely on shipments coming from Europe around uh, Southern Africa. So there was an apprehension that those supplies could come from uh, Norfolk Island. This was something which Cook and Banks had reported on, probably over-optimistically. The other thing was that there was a real apprehension about the French naval build-up. The French had been decimated in the Seven Years' War in the 50s and 60s. They hadn't gained much territory in the American Revolutionary Wars, and they were clearly rebuilding their navy. Their politicians wanted to um, um, recover uh, the lands and territories, or some of them, which they'd lost. In fact, they had entered into negotiations with the Dutch with a view to the Dutch and the French challenging the British in India. And uh, that's really why Philip was sent to France as an espionage agent in the two years before he was commissioned as the uh, prospective governor of New South Wales. He was sent specifically to report back on the French naval build-up at Toulon, the, the naval port on the Mediterranean, and the other ports of France, including Brest. He would, of course, have, have come across La Perouse at Brest at the time. Let me give you a few dates to put it all in, in perspective. So, uh, Philip is recalled from France in about August 1786, and the British start in earnest on preparing the expedition. 
That was preceded by these events. In February, Sir James Harris, who was the preeminent diplomat and the British ambassador at the, at the Hague, warned that the intentions of France in forming a connection with the Dutch are too evident to admit of doubt. Then in the next few months, the French started being provocative uh, in Bengal. Uh, then on the 1st of August, Harris wrote that there would soon be a major development and that France intended to send troops to the Dutch bases in India. On the 8th of August, he reported that the crisis is, quote, drawing nearer and nearer every hour. On the 16th of August, Sydney, the Home Secretary, responsible, strangely enough, for most aspects of foreign affairs, sent an account of the French naval capacity to the King, George III. George III replied with a letter which he dispatched within a few hours, in which he said something like this, France, certainly under the name of flutes, which is a French word for um, uh, transport ships dressed up, or, or, or military ships dressed up as transport ships, can soon collect a considerable naval force in the East Indies. So that's the 16th of August. Three days later, Pitt's cabinet decided to establish a settlement in New South Wales. They made that decision on a Saturday and announced it on the Monday. These are factors in the tapestry which, uh, in my view, made the decision to found the colony uh, uh, urgent and necessary. Now, I want to say something about the humanitarian aspects of the proposal. Philip wrote uh, that he was serving the cause of humanity. I've already explained the basic difference between the way the convicts were treated who were sent to Virginia and Maryland and the way the convicts were treated in New South Wales. What uh, it was hoped would be achieved under the New South Wales experiment was this. It was hoped that the convicts would be improved. Improvement was a key word of the Enlightenment and reformed. That the men would become peasant farmers, the women would raise children and the land would be settled. These goals were infused by a utopian idea of a simple rural society without money, as <laughs> David has mentioned, where convict men and women would become reborn through hard physical labour and subsistence farming. The central pillars of this scheme of improvement were, as I mentioned, the cultivation of the land and the issuing of land grants to deserving persons. Let me tell you something about the attitude to the Aborigines that Philip brought with him. His instructions from the king said this, among many other things, that he was to conciliate the affections of the Aborigines and he was to encourage everyone under his control, quote, to live in amity and kindness with them and to punish all who would wantonly destroy them or give them any unnecessary interruption in the exercise of their several occupations. Now, um, there's no doubt, however, that the uh, in a sort of misguided 18th century way, uh, they, um, they did some harm. Philip thought that he was doing the right thing. He wanted to cultivate the friendship of the Aborigines, but he didn't really appreciate, and I don't think anyone did, that they were actually invading their lands, destroying their fishing grounds, taking their oyster beds or ruining them, chopping down their trees, and really undermining their source of, of sustenance and living. But <coughs> Philip tried very hard to, despite those matters, uh, cultivate the friendship of the Aborigines. At first they stayed away and he was desperately upset about this. Uh, he shouldn't have been surprised, I suppose. Uh, they watched as their trees were chopped down uh, and their fishing grounds polluted. But eventually, after about 10 months, he said, well, we've got to do something. So he went across to Manly, uh, sent a, a group to Manly, where they effectively kidnapped Arabanu. Now, Arabanu was uh, surprised at this. Um, but, <laughs> to, to, to put it mildly. But, but, he so, <laughs> but he soon settled down, and he and Philip became the closest of comrades. And they would often be seen pottering about the harbour in a boat together. In fact, when the smallpox epidemic struck 
in the second year of the settlement, Arabanu and Philip went around together to the little coves and um, beaches, um, picking up uh, dying and sick Aborigines and bringing them back to the hospital. The hospital was the first establishment that Philip established on the rocks. The site's still marked there, I saw it the other weekend. Um, the, the, um, I'll come back to that Aborigine issue at just towards the end. The other issue uh, that is interesting to note is that um, um, David mentioned the fact that there was a gender imbalance. It was certainly a worry and some people predicted dire consequences. And Philip's instructions were therefore to procure women from the Pacific Islands, comfort women. Um, and this was something which Philip studiously ignored. He actually wrote to Sydney saying that to do so, that is to comply with his instructions, would only be bringing those women to pine away a few years in misery. But he suggested that it may be best if the most, and to use his language, it's rather quaint, the most abandoned of the female convicts might be permitted to receive the visits of the male convicts in the limits allotted them at certain hours and under certain restrictions. In other words, he wanted state-sponsored prostitution. Sydney and Nepean would not come at that, but I'm sure it happened and Philip turned a blind eye. Um, the, although tolerant of prostitution, he did take a strong view about sodomy and murder, and the actual words he used, his own words, David's alluded to them, were these. I like them. Um, <laughs> yes, he said, if anyone was found guilty of murder or sodomy, he would wish to confine the criminal till an opportunity offered of delivering him as a prisoner to the natives of New Zealand and let them eat him. <laughs> Slavery is another issue that often arises and Philip was ahead of his time here. He had, and I won't be talking about this tonight, you'll have to read about it, um, very um, a deep personal experience of slavery in South America under the Portuguese in Brazil and in Cape Town under the Dutch. Uh, he saw the worst of the slavery. Uh, after all, if you uh, read the accounts, uh, I've forgotten how many millions, but ultimately more than five million West Africans were shipped to uh, Brazil and other states of South America. That's not including those who were sent to North America. Philip saw all that. He saw the mines. Uh, he saw the uh, Dutch slave code in operation. So he wrote before he left, there can be no slavery in a free land and consequently no slaves. So the, the colony was to be established with no slaves, no currency, uh, and convicts who as soon as possible would be emancipated and given land in order to become free settlers and uh, cultivate the land and develop the colony. He. Um, he was on the right side on slavery, of course, because Pitt um, had spoken already at this early stage against slavery. Pitt's closest friend was William Wilberforce. And if you ever saw the film Amazing Grace, you'll understand the relationship between those two men. And William Wilberforce campaigned for 25 years to stop the British slave trade. Pitt actually said, um, a little after Philip came to New South Wales, no nation in Europe has plunged so deeply into this guilt as Great Britain. When he said that, he was in the minority by a long way. Now, another aspect of Philip's thinking about the colony, and one which I particularly like, is the imagery which emerges from the fact that he decided to call the colony Albion. Albion is the ancient synonym for Britain. Uh, and you can read about it um, in, um, in The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer and, and many other places. It's been around for centuries and centuries. But Philip was in good company because when Sir Francis Drake claimed the northern coast of California for Elizabeth I in 1579, he also called that land New Albion. Philip had these notions, grand notions, of um, creating a, a, a new um, a new Britain. In fact, he said, he said that the colony of New South Wales would, he thought, one day be the greatest acquisition that Great Britain ever made. 
Now, um, how much time have I got? Seven minutes. So, lovely. Um, there's, um, there, there's a feature of the story uh, of the arrival of the Englishman at Sydney that I always love to um, describe and talk about, and I usually play music with this part. I usually play Gabriel's oboe, if you know it. But it's the theme song to the mission when the Spanish missionary is going down the river being watched by the natives. Um, anyway, um, some of you will know that, um, that the first fleet, the 11 ships, arrived in Botany Bay between the 18th and 20th of January in 1788. <coughs> Philip had always been rather um, um, distrustful of Banks's excessively enthusiastic <laughs> descriptions of Botany Bay. And he didn't like the look of the charts that Cook had provided. As a very experienced naval officer, I think he could see that Botany Bay was too exposed to the elements, probably too shallow, and the water supply was doubtful. So even before he left Britain, he obtained permission to establish the settlement in any other port that he thought fit. He'd seen the chart, he'd noticed the entrance to, the, to Port Jackson, the heads. Cook had sailed past Port Jackson, and no, he hadn't been in there. He didn't know what was in there. In fact, no one knew what was within the heads. And this, what I like is that as soon as the last of the 11 ships arrived, Philip took three longboats. Longboats were, uh, as the name implies, longboats. They were rowed by seamen, usually eight or 10 seamen. The three boats rowed up from Botany Bay. It's about three leagues in naval language or about uh, 13 kilometers, I think, in our own language. They rowed up, entered through the heads. They were the first white men in the history of the world to go through the heads. And as they went through, the young men, the volunteers, the officers, um, such as the, the surgeons and the advocate general, the judge advocate and uh, several others, all recorded, <laughs> some of the Marines, recorded observations or certainly a little later recorded observations. And their observations are full of wonder at, at what they were seeing. So they, as they rowed quietly up the harbour, um, they, they moved their attention from its sparkling ultramarine waters to the shoreline. They were taken by the tall trees, the rocky outcrops, the exotic flora, and the sense of untouched Edenic beauty. The intense light and the brilliant colours filled them with eager curiosity and wonder. Singing from the treetops were strange and unusual birds, raucous shrieking cockatoos, absurd laughing kookaburras and brightly coloured lorikeets. Worgen, one of the surgeons, thought that its beauty beggared all description. Bowes Smythe, another surgeon, said that the flight of the parrots and the singing of the birds made all around appear like an enchantment. And Collins, the judge advocate, said later when he wrote down his observations and thoughts, he earnestly hoped that the convicts might be reformed and that we might not sully that purity of nature by the introduction of vice, profaneness and immorality. He paraphrased John Milton, the poet, and evoked a sense of the founding of a new civilization, which is exactly what they were doing. Um, there's another side which is humorous, and David ha and I have both spoken about this at the Writers' Festival. When Philip got his feet on the ground and got the convicts out of the ships and established the colony, he, he did a number of things. First of all, there was never a stockade. There was no prison. He let the convicts run free uh, and they could wear their own clothes, they could build their own huts. Unless they re-offended, they were not put in chains. Um, they were um, given as much um, slack as was reasonable. Grace Carskins, and I recommend you read her book, describes this in much more detail than I did. Um, within months of the, of the arrival, uh, some of the civilians were complaining that, to quote one, the marines and sailors are punished with the utmost severity for the most trivial offences, while the convicts are pardoned, or at least punished in a very slight manner, 
for crimes of the blackest dye. Philip clearly favoured the convicts. And then there was the question of rations. The Marines in particular were very upset and indeed very surprised that they were only given the same rations as the convicts. So one wrote that um, he, he, he could not believe that the administration had really intended that the only difference between the allowance of provisions served to the officer and served to the convict be only half a pint per day of vile Rio spirits. In other words, the Marines could have some South American rum, which was vile, um, but apart from that, the rations were the same. M Major Ross, Major Ross, who's been consigned to the dustbin of history, who was the vice governor, an, an execrable man, um, said, could I possibly have imagined that I was to be served with, for instance, no more butter than any of the convicts, I most certainly would not have left England. So the, the colony from the first days was the most egalitarian place that one could imagine. It was an experiment, it was a function of the Enlightenment, it was absurdly ambitious, but it all came together. And um, so I think that um, it's clear on what side of the title to this talk I come down on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.